morning, everyone. So my talk is about 10 insights into the cognitive science of filter bubbles. Just so if you don't know what cognitive science is, it's a, a discipline between a lot of other disciplines. It combines psychology, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and in general, it assumes that cognition is about information processing, and it can be both in minds and in machines. So that's what I do. So um, my plan is to give you now just some basic ideas about filter bubbles so that we can just start the conversation on a bit of a higher level instead of just starting uh, completely at the bottom. So, 10 ideas. The first one. Okay, we've already heard the name filter bubbles a lot. But of course, uh, filter bubbles come in very different shapes, with different flavors, and also with different names on it. So one name you might have heard before is echo, echo cam chamber, but there's also the idea of ideological segregation and polarization and also political propaganda, of course. So there's very uh, different concepts that are connected to this. Why is this so important? <laughs> so what I notice a lot, especially in my study, is that people often have a lot of arguments and in the end they figure out their main problem just was about words. They just did not define what they were even talking about. So it's very important to make sure to know what you're talking about. And of course when you look in the world there are different causes as well about, from, uh, of bubbles. So some are internal, the way we see the world, the way we compute information, but some can also be external. So like, for example, censorship that's political. And the same also means there can be unintentional and intentional filter bubbles. And depending on that, you of course need very different strategies to combat them. Like for example, education or really policy work. So that's very important. Re recognize what, what are we really talking about right now. Um, the second idea is that I find very important is about how do we humans gather social information. So when you look at the picture, the first thing you realize is you don't just see another human. You're really bad at differentiating between observation and interpretation. So for example, when you uh, see this person, you might think she's a punk, but and she's, I don't know, maybe doing drugs or something like that, or maybe she makes you feel uneasy, but you, you have all those ideas, and you don't think like, oh, this is this assumption I have, this might be true, but it really, you think that's how she is. But you don't know, maybe she's just a model and just like to dress up like this for a day. You do, do not know. But it pops into your mind very quickly and it's very hard to separate. And what's also interesting is that we, yeah, we, we try to make sense out of data. And um, for example, when we then meet a person that does not fit our stereotype, like for example, maybe she is, super nice, super friendly, then you say, oh, this is just a special case. This does not prove my stereotype about punks wrong. Because we still want to keep that idea. That's, of course, number three. Um, another very um, famous way of how we compute information. So here it's, I've heard the reporting from both sides. Time to do my own research. Literally the first link that agrees with what I already believe. Uh, so you might have noticed that before, this is called the confirmation bias. So the way we search and interpret data usually agrees with what we already believe in and doesn't really um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, disprove it. But that's not the only bias. There's a huge amount of different biases that have different causes. Some are just because of their state, of there being data o uh, overload. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's many different causes for biases and they all distort our view. But the good thing is, we are a lens that can learn about it, its flaws and therefore see more clearly. So that's a chance we as humans definitely have. Okay, so now we know there's confirmation bias, but let's imagine we want to disprove what we believe. Fact is, we even suck at this. So there's this example. Um, so I'm thinking of a rule, or like for a triplet, and I will show you one of them. And now you can ask me, I will not actually do this, but the idea is you can ask me um, different triplets, and I will tell you if they apply to my rule as well. So what do people usually do now? Usually they ask, oh, okay, does 8, 10, and 12 also fit your rule? And I would say, yeah, sure. And then people might ask, hmm, is it like 20, 22, 24 as well? I would say, sure. 
And then at some point I would say, okay, so is the rule always like two more? And I would say, no. Actually one, 100, and 1,000 will also fit the rule. So the idea is just the next number has to just be larger than the one before. There's no other rule. And what you see here is that we are really bad at testing our belief because you have this rule in your head and this idea of what might be true and you, you're super attached to it. But you don't actually come up with an idea of how else could it be and testing for that. So that's a very, very robust finding from psychology. Okay, number four. Our expectations create our social reality. Because what you believe about different people will change your behavior in that situation. And depending on how you behave, you will gather different observations because people will behave badly or differently towards you. Like if you assume someone has bad intentions, you might be a bit more aggressive, a bit less friendly, and they might be less friendly to you. So what you think about the world when it comes to social facts really changes the world. So that, this is called self-fulfilling prophecies. Number six, especially when you look at Twitter, uh, you might have noticed that some emotions spread far more easily than others. When you want to categorize emotions, what is, is usually done is it's around two dimensions. One is how positive and negative they are, and one is the arousal le level. So for example, you can be negative, you can have a negative emotion, and low arousal, which is like this very sad, un unmotivated state. But you can also be very high arousal in the positive state, which is like this excitement. What kind of emotions spread the best? That's, of course, the emotions that are negative in their quality and high arousal. So if you're just sad and demotivated, you will not just spread the idea. And if you're also happy, you don't really feel the need to change much. But if you're, for example, really angry, <laughs> then people immediately jump to action and share what they, what they think. So that of course makes the structure of, for example, the internet uh, shaped by our emotions because if you just think, oh, this is this very well thought through article, oh, let me just post this everywhere. This just does not happen, right? So it's inherently to how we just digest information that we spread some, uh, some emotions more than others. Um, <coughs> Yeah, that's something we've just experienced, actually. So, um, oh, what's this? Team A, team, team B, hello. Whoa, fuck that guy. Um, so, so that's number, number seven. What, what is the idea here? We, can, we know from psychology that we can be very easily divided into artificial groups that we then consider our in-group or our out-group. And this can be very superficial ideas or concepts that are attached to our identity and then we fight for them even though they're on a second thought is just no idea and no, no reason for it because we just feel like we're attacked and then you have moral outrage and then, then you just you become angry and just to know how artificial those boundaries can be is very very important of course we don't just have internal uh, problems but of course technology as number eight, also makes it harder. So for example, when we look at reinforcement uh, learning, today bots are motivated to make it easily predictable what people do online. And that of course is an incentive for them to polarize people, because the more extreme you are, the easier it is to predict your next actions. And that's of course something they optimize for. So that really shapes the way the internet is now optimized by, by bots. Um, but, number nine, technology can not only make it worse, it can also make it better. So, for example, what was recently done was um, they compiled a huge number of articles to see maybe there are researchers that were not mentioned in Wikipedia and they found out that there's actually a huge amount, especially of women, that were not really mentioned because, yeah, there, there indeed was some bias in how humans um, uh, computed information. So there is also a chance in artificial intelligence digesting information differently than humans to actually see the world more clearly. And number 10, there's this really powerful idea, maybe you know the Turing test, it's the idea if someone can, or like if an algorithm can convince you that it's actually a human, then it has passed the Turing test. Like you don't know that it's just an artificial intelligence. 
Here, the idea is the ideological Turing test. So if you really want to under understand the other side, you don't want to make it seem less simple, less <laughs> complex, you want to be able to say it in such a way, their idea, that they would agree with it and could not understand or could not easily see that you're from the other side. So you want to understand the other side that well by paraphrasing. That's called the ideological Turing test. So, there were 10 little ideas that I hope gave you some insights and let's start into the rest of the day. Are there any questions, one or two, that are burning or, uh, at the moment and you want to ask her some more details? Can you give like a, a more um, inside explanation, a quick one about number 10? Like I, I struggled a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is, um, there's even a page for that. So the idea is often you are not that good at understanding the other side and instead of really understanding how they are thinking, you will just do the straw man arguments. Like, I don't, like, ju you just uh, depict the other side as being stupid and just having bad intentions, but that's of course not how the real world is. So you try to really write down the argumentation, how the other side would do it, and if they read your argument and they could not say, oh, this guy actually is not agreeing with me, then you've passed the ideological Turing test because they can no longer see that you don't, do not actually agree with them and because you understand them so well. Right. Yes. Thanks again, Anna, for giving us a theoretical insight because I think this is great for our bubble meetings to have it as a grounding. Thanks again. Big round of applause for Anna.